Brothers and sisters, let us rejoice in our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. And in this great Lent, this fasting period, which has been bestowed upon us. And above all, for this divine and sacred pre-sanctified liturgy. If we think about the pre-sanctified liturgy, which is one of the oldest of the divine services in the church, I believe first mentioned in the second century. And the reason we do not sing the symbol of faith in this divine liturgy is because this liturgy is older than the symbol of faith. It was given to us before the symbol of faith had been assembled and put together and finally uh, approved in the church. Sometimes people think that Gregory of Rome had composed this liturgy, but he didn't. He simply preserved a copy of it from Constantinople, and it was from his rendition of it that we found the only surviving complete divine service of this service after the destruction of Constantinople. But let's contemplate for a moment the meaning of something pre-sanctified. When we stop to realize that God had pre-sanctified the word Jesus Christ before the creation of the world, before the creation of the universe, for the sake of our salvation, because God certainly knew about the coming of the fall of mankind and about mankind's desperation and about the corruption of the fallen human nature with its egotism, self-centeredness, self-love that has led us into so much violence and destruction over the centuries and the millennia of the existence of this world. Our Lord Jesus Christ pre-sanctified himself before the creation itself, before the fall, before all the tragedies of history, for the sake of our salvation, because God loved mankind even before mankind existed, and loved mankind and all those nations that did not yet exist. And we see the great glory of the co-suffering love of God for mankind in the meaning of that thing which is pre-sanctified. Of course we're referring to the pre-sanctification of the holy gifts for communion which takes place on Sunday. But this in itself is a type and a revelation to us. For we do not serve the liturgy on weekdays during the Great Lent because of the preparation for Pascha itself, because the holy mystery of communion did not come into existence until the mystical supper of our Lord Jesus Christ on the night before he was given up, or rather gave himself up for the sake of the world, to be crucified, to be the bread of life finally nailed to the cross. And then we would receive the bread of life in holy communion. And yet, as a type of a revelation and a prophecy. We see this as the knowledge of God preparing already for our salvation before we had fallen. For the pre-sanctification of our salvation and the pre-sanctification of the way back into the heavenly kingdom and back into paradise. And in this divine service, when we come together on these few days of Great Lent when we serve this service. We think more fully upon our own preparation. For the hymns of this divine service are all from the Old Testament, except for the Our Father. And these hymns take us back into the time of preparation as those faithful of the Old Testament seeing the promises that have been given and instantly serving God on the hope of those promises which were yet to be fulfilled. For in those days when the prophet Job could cry out, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he will stand upon the earth in the last days, and though I make the grave my bed, yet I will see him with my own eyes, 
and not with the eyes of another, by which he proclaims the resurrection, which would be made possible for us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So all of those Old Testament prophets, with all of their shortcomings, with all of their sins, with all of their failings, with all of the violence they involved themselves in, and yet knew how to repent, and how to believe, and how to trust in all the promises which God had given aforetimes, and to understand those prophecies, that in the fullness of time the one who had pre-sanctified himself for us before the creation of the universe would come and fulfill those promises and open for us again the gates of paradise and open those gates within the heart of those who would hear and would desire that that kingdom rule and reign in their hearts. And yet, brothers and sisters, how many people within the Orthodox Church, never mind all those others who confess Christianity, hear the words of the Gospel? And how many of us, when we hear the words of the prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian, grant that I might see my own sins and not judge my brother, and give me a spirit of meekness, humility, Meekness and humility not just before God, but before our brothers and sisters, before our neighbors, before the rest of humanity. And yet, even in the midst of this great Lent, with that prayer fresh upon their lips, it does not penetrate into the hearts of all. The prayer of St. Ephraim becomes merely a part of a ritual. People do not take it into their hearts and give it meaning and shape but rather continue to violate the gospel, to violate the image of Jesus Christ, to violate the pattern of life and the pattern of interaction which he gave to us. And we continue full of the worst kinds of judgment and condemnation, not simply trying to defend the faith, but judging and condemning our neighbor, our brother and our sister in the worst possible ways. And this great Lent has given to us so that we might struggle against those very things, so that we might realize the great love which God had for us before the foundations of the earth were laid. And we might in some small way strive to imitate that love for our brothers and sisters, for our neighbors, and to imitate that love for the rest of mankind and to obey the Apostle and to obey our Lord Jesus Christ to cover our brother's sins rather than to place them out in the open. To refrain from the kind of judgment and condemnation that makes the demons revel and that makes Satan rejoice because he's conquered us and conquered our hearts and closed the gates of paradise in our heart because we ourselves did not desire to have them open through following the life and the pattern of life and the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a fearful thing, brothers and sisters, to have the gates of paradise open in our heart only to turn around and close them ourselves with the help of Satan and with the help of our own ego and our own self-love and our own self-centeredness. So I beseech you all, brothers and sisters, to remember when you hear this name, pre-sanctified liturgy, that the Lord of glory had pre-sanctified himself to empty himself and enter this world as a babe in the depths of the earth, not even in a dwelling place, but in a place only fit for sheep and cattle, and to walk upon the face of this earth experiencing the cold and the heat, experiencing all the suffering that pertains to us, and to die the most shameless form of death in order to identify with the lowest and the meanest of humanity because of his great co-suffering love, that he, knowing all of this, had pre-sanctified himself for it, 
before he created us. Because he would create us out of love and he would redeem us from yet greater love. The co-suffering love of God with mankind. This is the mystery of our redemption. But if that is the mystery of our redemption, then the mystery of the salvation of each one of us depends upon our assimilating that co-suffering love also, so that it might burn up the dross of all those things that turn us into fallen humanity, that make us devious, that make us slanderers, that make us gossipers, that make us judgers and condemn condemners of others, and never seeing our own sins, or pretending to see them and pretending to repent, but heaping coals of fire upon the heads of others who are struggling themselves to rise above the darkness and into the light. Brothers and sisters, let us not close the gates of paradise once they've been opened in our heart and slink back into the darkness to hide from the light. And so often we do it not with great sins, not with things of note or things of moment, but in pity meaningless, and yet mean and nasty little ways. And this is what makes it the harder to struggle against it. But first of all, we should recognize the meanness and the nastiness that sometimes penetrate our hearts and bring darkness back and drive the light out. And keep under ourselves, as Apostle Paul said, to struggle against those things. And not to focus only on some great sins and great passions, but to focus upon the little things that day by day undermine our souls and our hearts, undermine our salvation, and little by little, day by day, snuff out the candles, the light, and bring darkness back in the place of that light, of the grace and the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, let us now, at this time, also pre-sanctify ourselves for Holy Pascha, for the radiance of the resurrection of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, and to pre-sanctify ourselves by doing those very things which Jesus Christ did, open our hearts and our minds and our souls to our brothers and sisters, and overlook their weaknesses and their shortcomings and their sins and their failings, for it is not for us to judge but for us to repent of our own sins and to be a help to raise up one another when we've fallen, but to raise up one another with tenderness and compassion and meekness and humility, not thinking that we're better than they, but thinking that if we help them up when they've fallen, they will be standing upright in order to help us up when we fall. This is truly the gospel of our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.